I have uh, two, two things to mention um, at the top. Um, the first is with regard to Nepal. The U.S. Pacific Command has activated a Joint Task Force 505 to support the government of, of Nepal and the overall U.S. government and international response to the April 25th earthquake. The Joint Task Force consists of approximately 500 personnel, and its headquarters will coordinate U.S. military relief efforts, working in support of the USAID Disaster Assistance Response Team, which is coordinating the overall U.S. government response, as well as with senior representatives from the U.S. State Department and other U.S. agencies. And with the monsoon season fast uh, approaching in June, USAID uh, is focused on addressing the critical needs of shelter and medical care. They are airlifting 2,190 additional rolls of plastic sheeting to Nepal to be transported to critical districts identified by the government. This is in addition to the emergency medical supplies USAID is also in the process of airlifting that will help 40,000 people for three months. Both commodities are scheduled to arrive this weekend. And uh, lastly, before we get started, Secretary Kerry uh, was in Riyadh today where he met with Saudi King Salman, Yemeni President Hadi, Saudi Foreign Minister Al-Jubair, and other senior Saudi leaders. Um, as you may have seen, Secretary Kerry and Foreign Minister Al-Jubair announced that the Saudis agreed to a five-day ceasefire and humanitarian pause to cover all of Yemen to start at a date to be decided very soon. They will discuss more details of how the ceasefire will work in Paris tomorrow, and of course, uh, this is all dependent on the Houthis agreeing to it as well. Secretary Kerry is on his way to Paris um, as we speak. So with that, over to you, Matt. Um, and we'll get back to Yemen in a second, but I just want to start with something that just happened, which is that uh, a judge in Canada has just ordered the release on bail of Omar Kabir. Um, I've been asking about this case for the last several days, attempting to find out if this government, which one presumes would have an interest, whatever that interest might be, but an interest in it, in the case, uh, if you have any position on it, and you and your colleagues have not I have responded by saying, by referring me to the Canadian government for any comment on it. Now that he has been released, this is a guy who has been convicted of killing a U.S. soldier. What, uh, mm -hmm. if anything, um, do you have to say about it? Um, I saw the report of that, Matt, just uh, just before I came out here. Um, so I don't have a comment right away, but we'll uh, we'll look uh, we'll look at that and, and we'll come back to you. Can um, you please? Yeah. Uh, does can I just ask in general? Sure. Does the U.S. have any have an interest in, in what happens to this guy? Uh, well, of course, uh, we have uh, we have an interest in working with uh, the governments uh, in countries to which Guantanamo detainees have been transferred. Uh, we work carefully on a case by case basis on each of those. Um, uh, so, so we certainly uh, have an interest uh, in in mitigating uh, the the risks that uh, uh, that that these uh, detainees uh, could represent. Um, as to a specific comment on that one, we'll come back to you um, after we've okay. taken a look well, at, the, at, the, at the ruling and. Uh, uh, and had a chance to. Well, can, uh, can you say then that sure. if you expressed your concern or your interest in this case to the Canadian government prior to today? Um, well, we have a close partnership with the Canadians. Uh, not a surprise to anyone. Um, I'll see if there's more we can say uh, about you our, can't say our that consultations. You were, into, you were in touch with them about this case because you certainly didn't weren't, weren't making saying anything publicly about it. Were you mm -hmm. privately in touch with the Canadians? I'm not asking what you might have said to them, but were you? In, what was? The U.S. government or the relevant agencies of the of the U.S. government in touch with the Canadians about this case as it proceeded along in terms of this bail hearing. And I understand. I, I don't have a timeline to offer. Of course, we've been in touch with the Canadians yeah. about uh, about the, uh, the the case um, as we are when uh, when we have uh, transfers. Um, I'll see if we can say more about uh, timing of those. Go ahead. Go to Yemen. Yeah. Yes. Um, I'm not sure I quite understand what it is exactly the Secretary and Foreign Minister Joubert announced today in, in, uh, in Riyadh. Um, it, uh, it seems to be a bit of a novel approach to announce a ceasefire that no one has agreed to, or that the other side hasn't agreed to, to be more specific, uh, and uh, in, in the hopes that they will agree to it. Um, is there any indication at all that the other side to this conflict is prepared to take the Saudis up on this offer? And if not, why come out and claim to have accomplished something that has not been accomplished? Well, uh, the, the Secretary uh, welcomed uh, the, the Saudi uh, initiative, uh, and uh, this initiative is to, to implement soon a five-day ceasefire. Um, and uh, both he and Foreign Minister uh, Joubert uh, 
urged the Houthis and those backing them um, to, uh, you know, not to miss this opportunity. Um, this, uh, as, as, they've, as they've said today, and as we've said all along, uh, the source of the current instability in Yemen is the aggressive unilateral actions uh, of the Houthis, uh, the support of former President Saleh, um, and, uh, and so that is the, the, the reason uh, for the situation uh, that exists in Yemen. Uh, the Saudis have responded to that. They're, they are, of course, as are we, concerned with the humanitarian situation. They spoke about that at some length as well in their press availability. And, and so in, in an effort uh, to, uh, to address that, the Saudis have, uh, have announced uh, their intention to carry out this ceasefire. Um, but of course, uh, as they've said before, this depends on, uh, on all the parties um, abiding by the ceasefire. Right. But my question was whether there's any indication that, that, that you have, whether or not you have any indication that there, this is anything more than an empty gesture. Well, I don't think it's an empty gesture at all. It's a, it's a quite clear. Um, you stop fighting, uh, lay down your arms, and allow it, <laughs> and, 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 and don't move. And, and then that, I mean, I, is there any indication that the Houthis are willing to take the, take, take, take the Saudis? Well, it's up to the Houthis this? to, uh, you know, to, to make, yeah, uh, to make their position. Well, Mr. And, Joubert said no. there hadn't been any contact between them and the Houthis. Um, the secretary, or it has been alluded to that the secretary spoke to Foreign Minister Zarif this week, earlier this week, about the situation in Yemen. I mean, who is it that's put that, that that's uh, that's putting the, the the pressure on the Houthis, or who who is it that is trying to convince them uh, to accept this uh, ceasefire offer, if anyone? Well, I'll let the Saudis speak for themselves. Uh, we uh, we have not had uh, we don't have any contacts with the, the Houthis uh, to read out. Uh, we've made clear uh, both publicly today. Um, that we think this is a, an offer the Houthis uh, should uh, should take up, and that this is an opportunity to uh, to uh, on the one hand to address humanitarian issues uh, through this uh, this pause, and also to get back to a political dialogue process. Can, can you talk about Secretary Kerry's call with Foreign Minister Zarif? I don't have any calls to uh, uh, to to read out in recent days. So um, he didn't make the call, or you just don't. Or, or I, I, I don't have any. Uh, I don't have any. Uh, is there something more specific you've? Uh, well, my understanding to? is that they, that they spoke, and that the, 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 the secretary's intention in, in, in making the call, at least one of them. Uh, I don't know if it was on more than one one issue, but was to um, ask the Iranians to use their whatever influence they might have with the Houthis to agree to whatever the Saudis might propose in the way of a, in the way of a ceasefire. Maybe, maybe that is incorrect, but um, I, I might be wrong. Get that you can't tell me that I'm wrong. Uh, I don't have any calls this week to, to read out. Um, mm -hmm. uh, again, our, our, our point of view on, on Iran uh, is, uh, is in their role is that those who back the Houthis um, it should use all their influence okay. to get the Houthis to I'll agree to the, the ceasefire. Don't you don't have any calls, or the secretary did not call a single person this week. No, you were asking about Foreign Minister Zarif. Uh, that was that was you the, the point. Okay. Um, yeah, go ahead, uh, Saeed. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, was this ceasefire, in a way, coaxed by the Secretary of State? Because it seems that the idea of a ceasefire or a temporary ceasefire was, you know, floating around, but it took effect today. Would you say that the secretary sort of pushed for this? Well, uh, the Saudis have been talking about uh, their their readiness to consider a mm -hmm. uh, a humanitarian pause uh, for several days. We've we've welcomed uh, those indications of interest, uh, and so naturally, the situation in Yemen was a topic of discussion today. Um, but I, I think it would be a mistake to suggest uh, you know that uh, you know to characterize it the, the way you would did. Be, this is something we both have an interest in. Would it be a mistake not to assume that the presence of the Secretary of State? Will the United States of America actually place some pressure on them to agree to that ceasefire? Again, I don't think we're talking about pressure. I think this is a, an okay. issue in which the Saudis and the United States both have, uh, have a very keen interest. Okay. What is the likelihood that this temporary ceasefire may actually take hold and go on for longer? Was it something that you'd like to see? Well, we certainly, you know, the, the, uh, the, uh, what was announced uh, was a five-day uh, ceasefire that would be then um, renewable. Um, so, uh, you know, that's, uh, you know, Certainly, it needs to start, and again, that depends on on the Houthis uh, to uh, to uh, abide as well uh, by a ceasefire in, in, in his throughout meeting, all of, throughout all of Yemen. Yeah, in his meetings with uh, President uh, Heidi, was 
this ceasefire talked about in a way that this is it. I mean, we have five days, we'll do all we can from a humanitarian point of view, and then fighting will resume, or was it a prelude for perhaps some sort of political talks between the two sides? And was Hadi ready to say, okay, we will, we want to assume the talk, we want to resume the talks? Uh, well, um, so, you know, President Hadi, as you know, is, uh, is going to be uh, convening a dialogue conference uh, in Riyadh on May 17th. This is, um, you know, to support the political transition in Yemen. This is uh, a conference that's uh, referred to in the UN Security Council Resolution um, 2216. And uh, so we support, uh, you know, as the Secretary said today, we support the conference and we support it in the context of a um, uh, the efforts to get Yemeni parties to engage in peaceful dialogue um, uh, in, in the UN, um, the UN-led negotiations. Now, uh, yes, the Secretary um, did, uh, did talk uh, to President Hadi uh, today, and, uh, you know, they, they, they covered, um, again, our, uh, uh, our interest in, on the one hand, addressing the humanitarian situation, also uh, our support for Saudi Arabia and for the legitimate government in Yemen. Um, and uh, the need for all parties uh, to get back to the political dialogue process. Um, yes, go ahead. Yeah. S same topic? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Please. Uh, do you wish that this ceasefire, if it takes place, to develop into a negotiation, <coughs> political negotiation? And if so, do you support Iranian participation in such negotiation? Well, there is there is a framework for for talks uh, and political dialogue uh, in Yemen, and that's a UN-led process. It's consistent with uh, the the GCC uh, initiative and the uh, and the um, the national uh, dialogue in Yemen. So that's the framework. Uh, again, there's going to be a conference uh, soon in Riyadh, which uh, Saudi Arabia supports, which we support, which President Hadi is convening. Um, and uh, we see that as part of the larger uh, process to have uh, political dialogue that leads to a resolution uh, of, the, of the situation in Yemen. We've, uh, as we've said over and over again, this depends on the Houthis engaging. Uh, that's something they haven't been doing up to now. Yeah, but you know that the Iranian play a major role in terms of trying to push the Houthi to negotiation, and they express their willingness to to participate in the negotiations. So my question is, do you support, I know that the GEC mm. don't like to hear about that. Do you support their participation if it could lead to Well, this is, this is a UN-led process. So any questions about the process, I'd, I'd encourage you uh, to, talk to, uh, to talk to the UN. Uh, in particular, there's a new special envoy uh, whom we support. Now, uh, with respect to, uh, to Iran and, uh, and its influence on the Houthis, we've, we strongly urge uh, all those who back the Houthis to use their influence to get the Houthis uh, to agree to the ceasefire and the humanitarian pause. That's, what's need that's what needs to happen um, uh, first uh, before any of these other uh, scenarios that you were describing. Um, same topic? Well, Iran-related. Um, anything else on... Yeah, okay, let's, let's go to that. Uh, I'm just wondering if you have anything to say about the, sh re uh, the Iranians uh, releasing the sh ship that was detained and whether or not the U.S. had any role in right. securing um, its Right. As release. we understand it, uh, the, the Rickmers uh, group, uh, as the manager of the ship, has announced that the, the ship has been released and is continuing toward its uh, originally scheduled destination. Um, the company would have more information on the details uh, of that. Um, our role over the past week has been focused on maintaining communications with the Republic of the Marshall Islands as the flag state and with the private companies uh, involved. Um, so we've remained engaged uh, in the ways that we've been talking about. So no U.S. contact with the Iranian authorities about no, our contacts have been with the um, with the, the companies and with the, the Marshall Islands. And then Saudi related. Wait, but just on that, did they pay out, get released? I mean, did, was there a financial transaction that occurred? Well, I I, I think I would refer you back to uh, to but you uh, were in the, communication to Rickmers, with them, the Rickmers so group. Um, well, uh, they've they've I think put out a statement uh, about this, um, and uh, they uh, they referred to a bond having been posted or a security having been posted. I'd refer you back to them for any any details uh, uh, of that um, uh, as far as how exactly that transpired. Um, okay. Yes? But originally, on the, on the ship was apparently detained because they did not pay their dues. I mean, they apparently used uh, uh, Iranian facilities and failed to pay whatever, you know, fees 
they were required to pay. So it was well. There have been there have been a, a variety of explanations yeah. uh, from. But have from you been Iran able to it. determine why they detained it to begin with? Well, again, we've been in contact with uh, with the companies involved. We'll we'll let them speak to uh, the particular but, details. But the US Samir? Didn't, didn't do anything to defend and protect the ship according to the security compact compact with the Republic of the Marshall Islands. Did you? Well, uh, we do have a security compact with the Marshall Islands, uh, which we've discussed uh, in a bit of detail. Uh, here, we have remained in close contact with the with the Republic of the Marshall Islands the government, and I think uh, our commitment uh, to uh, you know, free commerce uh, and uh, freedom of navigation and safe passage uh, in the Straits of Hormuz and in the region um, is beyond question. I think the, the steps that we've taken after this incident uh, took place, including escorting uh, some shipping, um, shows uh, that uh, that you know we maintain a robust uh, presence in the region and uh, the ability to deter uh, destabilizing activities. So, so you think you implemented the agreement, the compact in this case? Well, again, we've uh, you know we we have that responsibility under the compact. We uh, we immediately engaged with the Republic of the Marshall Islands. Uh, we have uh, you know we've had ongoing diplomatic discussions with them about addressing uh, the situation. Um, so we've uh, we've been uh, working uh, to implement that compact. I, I yes. Uh, if is there any question or concern about whether this bond that was posted uh, is legit? I mean, or uh, or is it's not a violation of any kind of sanctions? Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, again, we're aware of the ships having been released. We're still seeking uh, more detailed information. Um, it's not even clear that money necessarily changed hands here. So, um, so we're seeking more information uh, about that. Um, that would be, you know, our, our Treasury colleagues would be the experts okay. uh, on that. And then I wanted to go to a Saudi-related thing. Okay. Uh, no other questions on, uh, uh, on that? Yeah, please go ahead, Matt. Um, the Turks are saying that, uh, or announcing, or revealing, or whatever you want to use the, the, the word, this new arrangement that they have with the Saudis to train uh, Syrian uh, rebel groups, including some that the United States has particular concerns about. Uh, I know that the Pentagon announced today that the training in Jordan has begun, or at least some kind of training in Jordan has begun. But I'm just wondering, in general, what the U.S. thinks about this uh, Saudi-Turkish -Turk uh, initiative. Um, not clear to me. There's a new initiative uh, there, um, but uh, you know, we'll we'll let uh, them them speak uh, for the details. We've been clear that you know, Assad uh, must go, and we continue uh, to appreciate. Uh, our cooperation with uh, with our partners uh, in the region, including through hosting uh, the train and equip program, and and working to advance uh, the conditions in which a you know negotiated political solution, um, uh, which would stop the violence and address all dimensions of the conflict, uh, would become possible. But uh, I don't have uh, I don't have a, a specific comment on that uh, report. Could I just follow up on the yeah Syria uh, issue. Uh, Yes, yesterday, I think, the Secretary of Defense, uh, Carter, uh, said that they are, and, and the, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff also, they talked about safety zone. Is that something that is being uh, discussed again, that the United States is considering establishing a safety zone that is consistent with Turkey's demands? Uh, again, I don't have any uh, any any new uh, any new position uh, mm -hmm. on that to to, uh, to outline. Our position on that remains, um, you know, as uh, the same. That is. To have that kind of uh, military enforced zone would be uh, would have lots of complications and implications. Uh, we have remained in dialogue with our partners uh, to hear their views, uh, but uh, I don't have any new uh, any new position. And uh, yesterday, you talked about uh, Ambassador Rubenstein meeting with uh, Mr. De Mistura. Yeah. Did this meeting take place? Uh, no, that hasn't happened yet. It mm -hmm. uh, we expect it to happen uh, May fifteenth um, mm -hmm. uh, in in Geneva. Okay, so that that's a long ways out. Well, as as we described, you know, the way these consultations are are working, they are first of all um, organized and led by the UN Special Envoy de Mistura, right. and uh, he is consulting with the relevant parties. Um, so, you know, that is, and and this these are happening, um, you know, sequentially. They're not; these aren't negotiations where everyone is around a table. He's right. consulting right. with the with 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 the relevant parties. So, you know, when we'll you we'll, we'll talk to him uh, as soon. Yes. Right. When you say the relevant parties, for instance, I mean, there are militant groups uh, in, in Syria that really have no political 
the representatives and so on. Who are they meeting with? I mean, you know, the, I'd, refer the you to, I'd refer you back to the Qataris. I'd refer you back to the uh, so to the you know the special envoy and his uh, staff about the specific details of participation by uh, by Syrian um, he, parties. In, he said in, today in that he the will not meet with representatives me. or supporters of Jabhat al-Nusra or ISIS, uh, and obviously something that you do support him in this rejection, right? He will not meet. With well, I think our, you know. Again, I'd refer you back to him, uh, but our views on uh, on Nusra uh, and ISIL um, should be crystal clear. Uh, um, uh, Samir, on the same topic. Okay, and then we'll come to you, Ilhan. Yes. Do you have any update about the situation in the city of Qalamun in Syria? It's on the northern border of Lebanon, where a big battle is uh, expected to take place between the Assad regime and its allies and the opposition. And if it happens, it's going to have a big uh, negative impact on Lebanon. Mm -hmm. Do you have any? Uh, um, well, uh, I, I think uh, I, you know I don't have a battlefield analysis there. But what I what I can say is you know, that Hezbollah's uh, support for the Assad regime has prolonged the war inside Syria. It's brought extremism, including ISIL and Nusra, which we were just talking about, as well as direct security threats to the Lebanese to Lebanese territory, um, uh, because Hezbollah has joined Assad's fight against his own people. Um, you know, Hezbollah has dragged Lebanon into a war against the will of the Lebanese people. So we support Leban Lebanon's uh, the Lebanese government's policy of dissociation from the conflict in Syria. Um, Hezbollah has agreed to that policy in in the Babda Declaration. Uh, but has violated it, and uh, you know that's to the detriment of of the Lebanese people's uh, interests. So certainly we uh, uh, we are against that. Uh, Ilhan, thank you. Uh, previous question: Turkey saw the uh, partnership or this military agreement. Mm -hmm. uh, many reports tied the recent northwest gains by the rebels in Syria to this specific partnership between the uh, Turkey and Saudis. Uh, would you concur with that? Do you think these rebel gains, which you see extreme extremist uh, elements, uh, are tied to this Turkey-Saudi uh, close uh, relationship? Well, again, uh, I, I you know I'd refer you back to the governments uh, for the specifics of uh, of their uh, of their uh, policies. Um, but uh, I'm going to decline to do a battlefield analysis uh, uh, and and to link it uh, to those to those things. Um, On train and equip program, uh, mm -hmm. is this still this weekend in Turkey, Turkish uh, version? Uh, is these plans are still same uh, this weekend starting? Well, as 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 you know, Ilhan, the the train and equip program is a, a program led by the Department of Defense. So um, I'll I'll let them um, make uh, make any uh, any additional information uh, known about that. Um, uh, Final question. Yes. Uh, just today, uh, Turkey's main opposition party's vice chair stated that Turkey is Turkish troops. Uh, about to intervene in Syria, northern Syria. Uh, do you have any information or have you communicated with Ankara? Do you have any I don't have any information to, to share uh, about that. We'll, we'll go to Justin and then uh, come around the room. Yes, go ahead, Justin. Uh, thanks, Chef. Um, the next round of Cuba talks, is that May 19th? Is that right? I don't have an announcement to, to make about, uh, about just, the next round. Yeah, I don't know if that, I wasn't clear if that had been announced or not. I just saw a tweet on that, but uh, so you can't confirm. No, I, I don't, I'm not able to confirm right. that. And um, Matt, I know has been asking you a lot about Omar Qatar, and I know he already asked today. Yes. But uh, just to go back to that, do you, do you believe that Qatar uh, at this point poses a security threat to the United States? Uh, well, with uh, again the the, the, the Qatar case, uh, you know, we'll uh, come back to you with uh, any any uh, comment on uh, the decision today. Um, you know, Qatar was, uh, as as you know, he is appealing his conviction before a U.S. Um, court of military commission. Um, that's uh, that's an ongoing matter of litigation, um, but you know, it's uh, I think just worth uh, uh, pointing out. Uh, so I'm not I'm not going to comment on that ongoing uh, litigation. Um, and uh, beyond that, I think I'll wait to come until I come back uh, with a response to Matt's he, question. He is to address, out on bail to now. To address that though. as well. He's free now. He's out on bail. So 
I mean, I guess the the question is: Is this person a worry? Is this person a security threat? Well, again, aside we have from, we have a aside from the case itself. I mean, do you consider him a security threat? Mm -hmm. Well, we have a very strong and cooperative relationship with Canada on security and law enforcement issues. I think I'll leave it at that right. and, uh, and, uh, to comment on that. And you're just leaving us with you. You will not condemn this decision in any way. I mean, this uh, again, as I said to Matt, the, the decision came out just a couple of minutes before I walked out here. So um, right. you know, we're 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 looking at it, and uh, we'll come back to you with more. Um, Matt, um, the White House has already put out a statement about the formation of the new Israeli government. But I'm wondering if the State Department has anything to uh, to say to add. Well, you've seen, yes, you've seen the White House uh, statement, um, and of course uh, we, we subscribe uh, to, to the White House statement. We look forward to working with the Prime Minister uh, and his new government. I think the President uh, uh, you know, has emphasized, and the White House statement today also reiterates the importance we place on our close relationship, military, intelligence, security cooperation, um, as well as uh, you know, regional issues uh, such as um, preventing Iran from obtaining a nuclear weapon and the importance of pursuing a two-state solution. Um, at least one member, and perhaps more, of, of, of the cabinet, that would be the new justice minister, um, has something of a colorful past, um, at, at least in terms of uh, statements that uh, she, she has made. Um, there has been some concern expressed from the Palestinian side or the Palestinian community about about this choice and I'm wondering um, if the US shares any of the concerns that have been expressed by uh, by the Palestinians or if you have your own uh, opinions about the comments that she's reported to have made in the past uh, well I'm not going to comment on specific uh, ministers uh, in in the new in, in the new government um, now with uh, with respect uh, you know, we, we obviously um, you know, condemn any uh, statements that are uh, offensive or, or derogatory, um, but I'm not going to get into uh, commentary on, um, on specific uh, uh, individuals. So you, you have no concerns, specific concerns about, <clears throat> about, this, about this member of the government? Uh, I'm not going to comment on specific ministers. Okay. Uh, um, okay. You, you don't have any concerns? I'm simply not uh, not going to. Uh, I don't have any any comment on the on the cabinet uh, lineup. Uh, okay, to offer. and that would apply to governments in every country everywhere. Uh, I'm gonna you asked you a to, question about gonna, uh, about this gonna, one. I'm going uh, to I'm going to hold I'm going to hold you to it. I'm, I'm sure you'll uh, you'll you'll find uh, uh, opportunities to. Uh, I mean, it may be that you don't have any concerns. I'm just trying to. Mm -hmm. try, I don't know why it's pulling teeth to get. To no, get you just, to say, uh, not to, pulling teeth. I'm, I, I just don't have a comment. I, I don't have comments on the on the specific uh, cabinet ministers to offer. Um, I'm Said, follow up on this point that Matt was raising. The minister is the justice minister Elit Shaki, and last June. She basically called for the extermination of the Palestinian people. Are you not concerned that such a, a high-level portfolio, the Minister of Justice, who has called for the extermination of a people, you are not concerned that it is a member of a cabinet that you are saying you want to work with on issues like the two-state solution and perhaps arriving at a deal with Iran? Well, again, we look forward to working with Prime Minister Netanyahu mm -hmm. um, and his new his new government. Uh, mm -hmm. Matt asked a similar question. I said, you know, we obviously would condemn any statements that were offensive or derogatory, mm -hmm. and and certainly any that would uh, that would incite. Mm -hmm. But she also has, uh, you know, I mean, the, Matt mentioned the cultural past, but she led actually a, you know, a settlement movement. I mean, for for a very long time, you know, basically. Uh, initiating settlements, uh, doing all kinds of things, provoking the, the local population. I mean, she she really quite uh, quite effective or active within the sort of movement. That wouldn't bother you. Again, our views on mm -hmm. on settlements, uh, I think, uh, are are pretty well known. Okay. Well, so, uh, speaking of settlements, today the Israelis announced the building of 900 uh, new housing units in, in in a settlement in the West Bank. Any Jewish which do you have a comment? Wh which which are you referring to? I and just want to make sure I understand. Ramat I'm, Shlomo. Ramat okay. Shlomo today. They, yeah. Right. Um, well, uh, we've consistently said that we oppose, uh, we strongly oppose steps mm -hmm. by the Israeli authorities to advance construction in East Jerusalem. This is a disappointing uh, development. Uh, we're concerned about it, um, uh, just as a new Israeli government uh, has, been, has been announced. 
Mm -hmm. uh, Israel's uh, leaders uh, have asserted that they remain committed to a two-state solution, and we need to see that commitment in the actions of Israeli uh, of the Israeli government. Uh, Moving forward with construction of housing units in East Jerusalem is is damaging and inconsistent with uh, with that commitment. Uh, we continue to engage with the highest levels of the Israeli uh, government, and we continue to make our position clear uh, that we that we view uh, the, this as uh, illegitimate. Mm -hmm. uh, one final question on the formation of the Israeli government: uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu is keeping the uh, foreign ministry portfolio to himself, perhaps hoping that he could, you know. Uh, entice the Herzog into joining his government later on. But for the time being, is this something that you have no issues and no problem with if he keeps the, the foreign ministry portfolio? Uh, you know, it's up to Prime Minister Netanyahu to form his cabinet. Uh, we'll, uh, we'll let him uh, hit, so let him do that. Um, Sorry, I yeah. just wanted to go back to what you just said. You, you said that you, you're disappointed in this decision, on, um, and the Israeli government has continued to say that it wants a two-state solution. You say that this is, runs counter to that. And then you said something like, we need to see that in, what, did, what was We that? need to see that commitment, uh, I said, in the actions that the Israeli government takes. We, you, the, that, commitment that commitment to, 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 to a two-state solution. And, and, and if you don't? Well, we remain in, uh, in contact with, at the highest levels with the Israeli government uh, officials, uh, including on, on these, uh, these matters. Uh, I don't have... Uh, well, then what is the point of saying we need to see that commitment if... if, if, if it becomes the case that you don't ever see that, or you don't see the commitment, and you don't do anything about it. What good is saying that we need to see that commitment? Well, this is a long-standing uh, U.S. Uh, policy. Uh, we're uh, we're reiterating that policy in in relation uh, to to this, this specific uh, development uh, that Saeed uh, that Saeed asked about. Uh, this is uh, you know, this is uh, this is our okay. Well, so if, if you're disappointed in this decision, you're saying you're you're in fact saying I think. Correct me if I'm wrong. That the this new Israeli government is not really off to a very good start, at least as it, in, at least in terms of it, what the what the U.S. administration thinks about it. Is that correct? Well, uh, look, our policy on this on this is longstanding. Um, I'm in, not in your, uh, in your response to yes. the question you mentioned that it happened that, that this is comes as whether the this new decision whether this decision that. was uh, you know in train and uh, because I think Saeed had asked about this uh, okay, the same so issue not, earlier in the week. Okay, because it was. So I wouldn't characterize this as the first action of, of the new Israeli the formation government. Of yes. the government. Right. I, I believe so, yes, because, again, Saeed asked about this but earlier in the, answer, in the week before. Uh, right, but in the answer that you gave, you, I think that you said that it, you mentioned the fact that the new government had take, taken over. So. No, I, I said that this is, this, this is a disappointing development just as a new Israeli government has been, has been announced. Um, but right, but this is not I, a decision I believe the decision was made, but I, I believe it, that, that's correct. That's right. Um, uh, yeah, and yeah, Iraq, and then Iraq. we'll, yes. Uh, yesterday, at an event at the Atlantic uh, Council, the KRG president, uh, Masoud Barzani, I mean, I asked him a pointed question about the independent I'm sure you Kurdistan, did. And, and he said that, for sure, it's coming. So you, you guys uh, are fine with that, so we are likely to see an independent Kurdistan, and you are likely to support it. You've made several leaps uh, there from the question uh, to our policy. There's been no change. In, uh, in U.S. policy, uh, as I think we've uh, talked about uh, in advance of, uh, of the visit. Um, uh, we believe that a united uh, Iraq is a stronger Iraq. We continue to support an Iraq that is federal, democratic, pluralistic, and unified as envisioned by the Iraqi Constitution. So there's been no change in the, in the US, uh, U.S. view. And I think uh, also uh, President Barzani um, uh, t spoke to this as well. You know, Iraq's territorial integrity is under threat from ISIL. Um, mm -hmm. And the only effective way to address this threat is for all uh, communities, Sunni, Shia, Kurd, to work together and address uh, these security needs, uh, as well as in the political realm. A and I think uh, President Barzani also um, stated yesterday that the, that the fight against ISIL needs to be the priority. Mm -hmm. Well, once that priority is handled and taken care of, or Mosul is liberated and, you know, and ISIL is defeated, uh, then the independence of Kurdistan would be, uh, would be fine, wouldn't it? 
That's, uh, I, again, I, I, I'm, I'm sure you were listening to my I, answer, I, I, but, okay. but, but I'm going to repeat it uh, because uh, it, it's important. It, there's been no change in U.S. policy. Mm -hmm. uh, we believe that, uni that a united Iraq is a stronger Iraq, and uh, we, we believe in an Iraq that is federal, democratic, pluralistic, uh, and unified, as envisioned by the Iraqi Constitution. Would you, would you uh, sort of support a more robust autonomy in the northern region of Kurdistan? Again, we support uh, you know, the, the, the Iraqi constitution um, and, uh, and an Iraq that is, uh, that is federal, that is democratic, it's pluralistic. Uh, I don't have any further uh, uh, comment uh, on it uh, th than that. Uh, Goyle. Uh, as far as the earthquake or natural disaster in Nepal is concerned, and Nepalis are still crying for U.S. help. Of course, U.S. was the first one to reach the need. But also, thousands of Nepalis in the U.S., many of them want to help and go back to their loved ones, but they cannot because they have no proper visas, and they are seeking U.S. help to make exception one time for them so they can visit and help the loved ones. And a couple of congressmen or senators also, including Senator Schumer, I believe, is trying to help if this possible. State Department does support this policy, one time exception for these needy? Uh, well, I'm not familiar with, uh, with, that, uh, with that specific um, uh, concern having been raised. Of course, the United States is doing a lot for, uh, for the people of Nepal and to help um, both in the, uh, the rescue and now in the recovery uh, phase. Um, you know, if there were any questions about visas and so forth, uh, you know, those, uh, depending on where the person is, those are a shared responsibility between the Department of State and the Pro Department of Homeland Security. Um, but I don't have, I don't have any, specific, any, any new um, uh, programs or announcements to make uh, about that. And one on India. Uh, uh, Mr. Arun Kumar, Arun Singh, is back now, who was the DCM, Deputy Chief of Mission at the US Indian Embassy in Washington, as the full-fledged ambassador of India to the US. And yesterday, he was speaking at US-India Business Council, just like uh, Ambassador Richard Verma was speaking at Carnegie. Um, uh, ambassador Arun Singh said that, uh, uh, because he played a big role in US-India relations as DCM in Washington, and uh, including civil nuclear agreement and other many uh, economic issues and all that. Yesterday, he spoke with this 500 fortune companies, and he said his mission will be here to foster further the U.S.-India relations as President Obama and uh, Prime Minister Modi both uh, initiated mm -hmm. so many issues. My question is, how you think this new ambassador of U.S. in India and new ambassador of India in the U.S. will play these relations between the two countries? Uh, well, you know, the, the, of course, the ambassadors uh, both play extremely important roles. Uh, we've talked a lot about the uh, the relationship between the U.S. and India, um, how it has, uh, you know, been uh, been receiving high level attention from the president, from Prime Minister Modi. Uh, we certainly see the, those relations as improving, and we want to uh, keep uh, keep that trajectory uh, going. And so, of course, uh, the ambassador is going to play uh, key roles. Uh, in doing that across the broad spectrum of our uh, of our relations. Um, uh, Tell me one more yeah? quickly, yeah. please. Thank you. Um, so much going on in, uh, in around South Asia, like uh, China, Pakistan relations, and now India and China relations. Uh, Prime Minister Modi is going to visit China for the uh, three days next week. And uh, you, do you uh, have any concern because? Uh, of the U.S., uh, Pakistan, and U.S., India, and now those uh, China is trying to get the business from these countries, and uh, they are getting closer and closer. Uh, we support good relations between China and India, so I don't have any any comment on uh, on that travel. Go ahead, Tower. Thank you, sir. Uh, yes, I have one on China. Yes. So yesterday, the State Department called for the release of human rights lawyer uh, Pu Jochong, and the Chinese Foreign Minister Foreign Ministry responded basically saying that the U.S. should stop being the world police and. It's really none of your business. Um, on what basis does the State Department feel like can call for the release of this lawyer in China? Uh, well, uh, you know, I think we've talked uh, talked about uh, you know the fact that uh, you know human rights, uh, international human rights, uh, are uh, not not bounded by uh, by borders, um, and we uh, we of course make uh, the promotion of human rights uh, one of our priorities in our foreign policy. And so we, uh, we speak out about uh, human rights, uh, and uh, that's part of who we are as Americans. It's part of our foreign policy, and uh, it's, uh, it's something we do around the world. 
And the ministry also said that the U.S. should focus more on its own issues. I guess making a, a reference, a bleak reference to Baltimore. Uh, how would you respond to that criticism? Well, I think it's clear if you look at the U.S. government's uh, response to the situation in Baltimore from the very top, from the president uh, to the attorney general uh, and on down, uh, also at the, the state and local level, um, you know, we, uh, we have uh, focused uh, on that situation and, uh, and, and both at the federal, again, at the state and local level are uh, you know, they're taking uh, steps to address uh, those concerns. So I, I think that uh, it's a situation where the United States recognizes uh, when, uh, when, there's, when there's a situation that, uh, that requires attention, and we take all steps to do it. So I, I don't think, I think we're, as we've said before, we are happy to put our record uh, in, in dealing with, with difficult uh, domestic issues uh, up against any other country uh, in, in the world. Yes, Matt. You would, you would reject the Foreign Ministry's allegation that weighing in and calling for this guy's uh, this guy to be released is an is interference or meddling in the oh, Chinese judicial system. Certainly, we would. Yes, we would. Okay, so you want him? You still think that it would be a good idea for him released? You have I actually, we stand by the statement uh, that we've. Uh, so you, ha made. you have a, you have a position on this guy's in prison, continued in prison, and yet you don't have a position, or you're unable or unwilling to say whether you have a position about a guy in Canada who has just been released on bail, who has been convicted of killing an American soldier and served a lot, a lot of time in Guantanamo Bay. Well, uh, Matt, uh, first of all, It would seem to me different. that the U.S. government might have e even a m more significant interest in that case than it, it has in the case of a, a Chinese uh, person who has been incarcerated for what you believe to be wrong. Matt, and I'm not saying you should call for his release. Mm -hmm. But I would think that you would have some kind of position that you could enunciate publicly. No? As I said, Matt, um, you know, you asked this question. You know, we, we did not comment on the ongoing uh, judicial proceedings. They have just concluded uh, about an hour or so ago. We're going to look at that and come back, come back to you. I have two brief ones. But... Um, yeah, Ilhan, then we'll come back. Yes, one quick question on Syrian refugee, refugees. Uh, mm -hmm. Do you have any updated information regarding how many of the Syrian refugees have been taken by the U.S.? The last time I checked, about six months ago, it was about less than 200. Do you have any updated information on that? Um, I, can, I can look and see if we have updated numbers. As I'm sure you recall uh, at that time, uh, you know, the, uh, although there has been a large number of, of Syrian refugees, it is only recently that uh, the UN High Commissioner for Refugees yes. has begun referring them for resettlement uh, in, in other countries, which is why uh, the, the numbers uh, have, been, have been low. That's uh, one factor, of course. Uh, the United States you know, admits more refugees than the rest of the world combined, and we've said that we will be uh, admitting greater numbers of Syrian refugees. Um, of course, there, this is a process um, that, uh, that takes some time. Um, as individual cases move through the pipeline. So uh, we're happy to look and see what the updated number is, but I just wanted to put it in that, uh, in that context. Um, yeah, Saeed, and then we'll go over, yeah. Very quick. Yep. Today, the Russian embassy is celebrating the 70th anniversary of the defeat of fascism. Are you sending anyone to the embassy from the State uh, I wasn't aware that they were doing an event uh, today. I don't really uh, have information about, uh, about the event uh, or participation. Yes. U.S. Ambassador to NATO, uh, Douglas Lute, complained that he knows very little about what's happening in Donbass, saying that he gets more information from social media than from, quote, official intelligence networks, because networks do not exist today, he said. Would you say that social media are a reliable source of information for a top U.S. official? I'm sorry, I'm not familiar with the comments that you're attributing to Ambassador Lute. I'd like to see those comments before I respond. Social media, what would you no, say? No, I'm sorry, I'm not, I'm not going to respond to that question until I see exactly what Ambassador Lute said in the context in which he said it. I'm not going to be uh, drawn into that. Matt, what did you want to say? Um, I didn't want to say, I wanted to ask. Uh, are you guys, and this is kind of uh, the beaten track a little bit, but you remember the case of the prosecutor who was found dead in Argentina, the whole uh, rigmarole over that? The, yes, the, the I The discussion remember. is continuing down there, a medical teams talking about what is that does is the u.s government following this uh, at all or is it is following it, in what sense well the continued discussion debate in argentina over uh the the circumstances of the prosecutor's death and what he was in, and, and aside from that what he had been investigating and what he had alleged or is this a is this a, 
water under the bridge. Uh, well, uh, again, I, I don't have an update on the particular, um, you know, uh, situation. Again, we've we've followed the case, um, but I, I don't have a, a comment on the on the latest developments. Okay. I haven't seen uh, recent developments in the last few days about that. And and the last one goes back to um, the, the questions about the, the donations to the Clinton Foundation and whether or not the State Department is going back at least uh, has has. Whether or not the questions that have been raised in the numerous reports that have come out over the past course of the past couple of weeks, whether or not the State Department it, it has the same questions, whether or not the, the Department right. is looking into them, in particular uh, about the donations that were talked about in the Boston Globe story to the Health, Health Foundation that were not disclosed as they should have been under the MOU, is this an issue? Uh, for the State Department. Okay, you you and uh, Arshad both asked about that earlier in the week, <clears throat> and and I have a little bit more uh, to say about that. I, I would start by saying um, I think it's important as a baseline to uh, to recall that the same rules that apply um, in terms of ethics uh, apply to every employee in the executive branch, um, and they also apply to secretaries of state, uh, among other things. Uh, generally, this means that employees must not participate personally or substantially in matters uh, with a direct or predictable effect on the employee's or on his or her spouse's financial interests and should recuse from particular matters involving um, a spouse's employer as a specific party. So that's, that, that applies to all. Um, and in addition to those requirements, um, before taking office, uh, Secretary Clinton uh, there were three undertakings. Uh, one was an ethics letter um, mm -hmm. from um, Secretary Clinton. The second was a memorandum of understanding, um, which dealt with the Clinton Foundation. And then third was an ethics letter from former President Clinton. Now, these, these were all steps that were taken voluntarily in the interest of transparency and went beyond the existing um, uh, ethics uh, requirements. Now, as we've discussed, the department reviewed every request, every request submitted to us um, under under the terms of those that primarily consisted of speeches and consultancies by former President Clinton. And uh, over the course of her tenure, the State Department reviewed dozens of entities each year. Um, you've uh, mentioned the um, foreign government donations. Uh, we regret that we did not have the opportunity to review all new and increased foreign government donations. We've spoken about that. Those now, are the two. Hmm? The two? Yes. Um, there has there also. There aren't any more that have come to light. No, not, not that I'm aware of. Um, there's been discussion about private uh, donations, um, and uh, that I think was what brought us to the question you, you raised earlier in the week. Um, the idea that the foundation and its affiliates would publish all of their private donors, um, which was one of the two terms of the MOU, was intended to provide additional public transparency. Um, but I would note um, that, that even if all of the private donations um, had been publicized, um, there was no expectation under the MOU that the State Department would be, would be reviewing uh, those. You know, we, we agreed in the MOU, or committed in the MOU, to review the new or materially in increased foreign government uh, donations. So there's a distinction um, there. Going, going back to the private donations, uh, the Clinton Foundation appears to have uh, published online uh, now all the donations from this period, and uh, I believe they've announced plans to do so each quarter. And the Clinton Health Access Initiative has said they are undertaking reviews of past uh, tax filings as well. We welcome these steps uh, to ensure that all foreign uh, donations are public. Now, at this point, our role has changed. Uh, Secretary Clinton is no longer at the department, so for questions about the foundation or the Health Access Initiative uh, or any of the uh, offshoots and their funding, uh, we'd refer you back to them. Uh, the State Department has not and does not intend to initiate a formal review or to make a retroactive judgment um, about items that were not submitted uh, during Secretary Clinton's tenure. Uh, the department's actions under Secretary Clinton were taken to advance administration policy as set by the president and in the interests of American foreign policy. And to be clear, uh, coming back to something that has come up earlier this week, we aren't aware of any actions taken by Secretary Clinton that were influenced by donations to the Clinton Foundation or its offshoots or by speech honoraria and consultancies of former President Clinton. Okay, but why not? I mean, 
Why, why, why do you not intend Again, we, are, to... we aren't aware of any actions uh, well, taken. I know you're not aware because you haven't looked into them, right? Well, but again, let's let's go back to what what we did do during her tenure. Over the course well, of her like, tenure, we reviewed dozens of entities each year. Um, the Clinton Foundation also is a charitable uh, organization, so we would not have had the obligation to review uh, their donation beyond what was committed to in the MOU. Right, but the, but what they committed to in the MOU in terms of the listing the the, the private donors, whether or not. The State Department had to review them or was supposed to review them beforehand to see if they were okay or not. It would seem to me to make sense that if they d didn't live up to their M end of the MOU, you would at least go back and take a look at the private donations and see whether that might raise any questions. But maybe not. I mean, I don't, I don't, I don't it seems like. You're not aware of anything, and there may not be anything there. But the reason that you're not aware of anything is because you're, because not, and not you personally, but the, mm -hmm. the reason you're not aware of anything is because the building is refusing to go back and look at it to see if there anything that might raise a flag. Well, again, these uh, these private uh, donations uh, were were there was never any expectation that they would be reviewed. Right, but there um, was an expectation that they would be made public, and so that you could go and look and see. Well, hmm, and then. And they weren't made public, and so now that they are being made public, wouldn't it make sense? And tell me if I'm wrong. Maybe it doesn't make sense, but wouldn't it make sense to go back and take a look at them and and see whether there were there, there's any any questions raised, any red mm -hmm. flag that might get raised? I don't understand why you would just close your eyes to it, because they've admitted that they didn't live up to their end of the MOU on this. Yeah, and they've, uh, but they have subsequently. Uh, you know, I know, but you're, but, and, taken steps but you're not to right. But that. you're, but you're not going and looking at what they've done to address that to see if it brought them into compliance. It's almost as if they had an agreement that they didn't follow through on. But since she's no longer the Secretary of State, you're saying, well, that doesn't apply anymore, and so you know, it, it, it just mm -hmm. doesn't matter. But look, what you, you know, don't what know if it doesn't matter or not because you're I, not looking into. I it. think I think what we've seen, uh, you know, what we've seen is speculation. Um, we haven't. Uh, yeah. We're not. We're not aware of uh, of any actions uh, taken uh, that uh, that were influenced by right. Uh, but, you, but you're not aware. It will. Yeah. Yes. What what has what has been put out there is que our questions. But you're saying that the State Department doesn't ha either doesn't have the same questions or isn't interested in finding out what the answer to those questions is. That's what it sounds like you're saying, because you're saying that you're not going to go back and look to see whether the violations of the MOU might raise questions or raise red flags about what was going on, right? Well, again, we uh, we have uh, I think I don't have anything to say beyond what I've said. We we ha we have uh, we are not aware of any uh, of any um, indication that uh, that there was uh, influence by these donations. Um, we have reviewed entities as I described under the MOU. These uh, ent these private donations would not have been reviewed by the State Department in any event, um, and we are not uh, you know going back to do a retroactive uh, examination of. Of each of those of each of those cases, um, and uh, we're not going to make a retroactive judgment uh, on 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 those items. So, so that's uh, all right. I'll, I'll yeah, yeah. defer to someone else. It just doesn't make. That any was sense my to question. Me. It was the the same as Matt's. You you've said this multiple times now. You're not going to make a retroactive judgment. Why not? What what is the reasoning beside uh, that follows up on that decision? Because that decision. Um, is important and makes it look like, as Matt is pointing out, that you don't want to find something that would look bad on no, the secretary uh, who's running no. for president. No, uh, no. Again, the these private donations, which were the the reason these uh, these questions uh, arose in this in this briefing room, um, were not uh, to be reviewed by the State Department under the terms uh, of the MOU. Um, but that and was if the MOU was adhered to. And it and it wasn't. And again, I don't think no one's saying that there is that there is in, certainly that there's something wrong, but there there are questions out there that have been raised, and not just raised by opponents of political opponents, but by but by many others as well. And if the State Department isn't interested in finding out the answer, I mean, it, is there a reason why the State Department is not interested in finding out whether there was uh, even uh, a, a question of or an appearance of any kind of impropriety. 
again, we're not a, we're not aware of any. Um, no, you're and, not aware of any because you're not looking. You're not looking back. Uh, you know, I, th I think. I mean, I can understand why you would say, okay, if they didn't, if they had agreed, if they had complied with the MOU and published these donors every year as they said they were going to do, I, I can understand why mm -hmm. then that wouldn't be an issue. But the fact of the matter is, they didn't publish those things, so you don't know. You would have had the opportunity to know, even if you weren't required or even if you weren't going to review them. But you would have had the opportunity to look and see the list and see and, and, and see if there were any issues there. And you didn't have that opportunity, just like the public didn't have that opportunity. And now we're in a position where you are going to have the opportunity to do it because they're going to comply ex post facto with the, with the MOU, but you're not going to take the opportunity to do it. And I guess that's just what that that's what is the is, is puzzling to me. Uh, well, I don't have much more to say uh, beyond uh, beyond what I've said. Um, all right, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.